and I was hoping to get more of a moment of honor for those people by our president today. But when I heard the president of the United States stand up there today and say this, we're living in a time when democracy is more at risk across the world than any point since the end of World War II, since these beaches were stormed in 1944. Now we have to ask ourselves, will we stand against tyranny, against evil, against crushing brutality of the iron fist? Will we stand for freedom? Will we defend democracy? Will we stand together? My answer is yes, and only can be yes. We're not now, nor have we ever since then faced anything. I mean, it's not even in the same book, let alone the same page. Anything like what was happening in 1944. Look, I, I served nine years in and out of Iraq and a ton of other countries, most of which didn't fight me. And it wasn't even close to a single day on Normandy. None of it. You, you want to know what they were facing? A man gassing six million people set on complete world domination. He had taken over almost all, the entire continent of Europe. He had taken control of business, he had taken control of commerce, schools, anything else he could seize. And you know what we you know how we defeated that? Mostly kids. 15, 16, 17 years old even. They lied about their age to go fight this fascism. Americans, they dropped everything, left their homes, they left their businesses and their families to trade lead on a battlefield 3,000 miles from home because they knew if they didn't. There was no more America. How many people today would answer that call? I venture to say not as many. Our military certainly doesn't have the same resolve it used to. Take a look at this picture right here. Take a really good look. Close your eyes. Put yourself there. You're 19 years old. You just came out of four weeks of basic training. You hear the bullets hitting the ramp on the front of the boat over the engine screaming as you're literally driving as fast as that thing will go into a gunfight. That ramp drops and you're in what we call the fatal funnel. Row after row of people in front of you. They're just eating lead, blood everywhere and the boat captain is screaming and yelling at you to get the hell off the boat so he can get back and get the next wave of troops. You jump out, you're in waist deep water with 50 pounds of gear on. Open your eyes, folks. Look at this picture again. You see a thousand dead and wounded soldiers in front of you. You have four football fields between you and your first even ounce of cover from bullets coming across the beach. You see the flash from dozens of fortified machine gun nests on the cliffs over the beach. On cliffs, the first wave that actually made it up there, they're pinned down, wounded, no way to effectively hit the firing station, so they're just stuck there. Now imagine this. You're 19 or 20 years old, and you're there now. Now you have to get to that first wave, 400 yards. That's a quarter mile away. You have to lay down, once you get there, Bangalore torpedoes that weigh 20 pounds. you got to push them through an open minefield and blow it up so you can get through it while being rained down on with mortars and bullets from somebody that knew you were coming. When you run out, you have to go back across that 400-yard shot zone to the dead bodies of your friends to get their munitions that were killed on the beach that morning. And while you're still being shot at, by this time it's probably only 8.30 in the morning, in the first wave, they've been fighting for two hours. Over a million enemy rounds have been fired at this point. Imagine, uh, just imagine, your ears are ringing. You got blood, sweat, salt water, and sand running down your face, and you move to clear the football field long minefield in front of you, only so you can start scaling the cliffs Thousands of you and your fellow soldiers, you're running in full combat gear and you're climbing up a cliff as fast as you can and continues to get shot at. You reach the first machine gun nest, you throw a grenade in, you think you killed everybody in there, so you climb in, and just as you do, you turn around and you're looking straight into the eyes of another 20-year-old German soldier with a bayonet fixed right at you. You have to look him in the eye and kill him. After four hours of gunfights, clearing minefields, scaling a cliff, and now you're in a hand-to-hand -hand combat to the death. And if you came out of that, you stood up there, you gave your signal that you would clear the nest. That was day one. Because over the next four days, almost 350,000 more troops with 50,000 more vehicles and 100,000 more tons of ammunition, supplies, or whatever would arrive for you to do it again every single 
day for the next two months all across Europe. And six weeks ago, you were probably working in a barber shop or a factory or working out on your farm. That's the cost of freedom. That's what it costs to defend it. 50 million, 50 million people, more. 3% of the world's population was killed in World War II. And almost half a million US troops died. I mean, you ever ask me why I fight so hard, why I joined the military? Because I never want their deaths to be in vain. The greatest generation gave far too much for me not to raise that flag, for me not to stand up for the anthem or the principles that they fought for. So today, especially today, be someone worth dying for. Millions did.